Hello everyone, it's Richard Lewis here with another video and today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be taking a look at politics and sure, we do that quite a lot in this channel, usually breaking down journalistic reportage of modern political phenomenon. But what we're going to be doing today is actually taking a look at history and, and, and something historical. Now, just to frame what we're going to get around to talking to, which is a very important part of history that I think we need to remember so we can make accurate comparisons about where we stand as a society and politically now, uh, I just want to remind everybody about something that's going on in the, in the media, and I'm sure it hasn't escaped your attention, and that is these comparisons of Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler. Now, Perhaps many of you watching my videos think this is apt. Perhaps many of you think this is ludicrous. And I certainly am very much in that latter camp. But either way, it can't have escaped your attention that it's happened often, significantly often, during the election cycle. And after the election, after Don in the build-up to Donald Trump's inauguration and beyond. And it continues to happen. Even today, it's been reported in the mainstream media. Erroneously, I would go so far as to say that Amnesty International have compared Donald Trump to Hitler. This is a little bit disingenuous because what they actually said was that Donald Trump's political campaign with its xenophobia was similar to the 1930s. They didn't name Adolf Hitler, but uh, the mainstream media were very happy to infer it because the headlines um, uh, that you know that sell have to include these Trump Hitler comparisons. It stirs the emotions, it stirs the passions. But there was a, another uh, example, just uh, also that I saw published today, that really kind of um, blew my mind a little bit. It was an interview with Tucker Carlson. And Tucker Carlson over on the Fox News Network, he's made quite a habit of inviting on people who uh, are very progressive in their thinking and, and, and trying to dismantle their arguments. His interviews are all pretty much identical, I would say, in the sense that they pick somebody who has a point to make about Trump and, and the right wing and, and conservative elements uh, of, of the political uh, spectrum. And they come on to the show and they struggle to try and get out the sound bites they want to. They don't really answer any of Tucker's questions. Tucker kind of laughs them off and makes them look foolish. And this usually takes, you know, between five and ten minutes to do. They're all the same. They're all identical. And um, I, I, I would like to see something a bit more substantive, actually. I'd like to see a better caliber of guests going on and, and having a discussion because Tucker Carlson's obviously a very intelligent man. And he will have no trouble dismantling a lot of these idiots because they're ill-equipped for this kind of debate. That's what happens if you just pick up a guy you know, from the lunatic fringe who's on a protest march as opposed to, say, a professor of political sciences. Although what's going on on American campuses these days, perhaps a lot of these professors would also fall into the ill-educated, fanatic, you know, kind of category. But anyway, there was, there was one that was brought to my attention today, and this was an interview with the Revolutionary Communist Party's Sunsara Taylor, and over the course of this interview, she makes many fantastical claims. She is absolutely very comfortable with the comparison of Trump to Hitler. Uh, and also says that Trump's plans are to have some sort of totalitarian regime and enact a global genocide. Uh, now, don't take my word for it. I'm going to show you clips of uh, these outlandish claims and you can make up your own mind about whether you feel these come from a place of being well-informed and well-educated about the subject or a more emotive kind of, you know, area. ...office in America has not become a totalitarian death state just yet. Regardless, some are still trying to ignite an uprising to throw him out of power. 
A group called Refuse Fascism says its goal is to, quote, drive the Trump-Pence regime out. They describe it as illegitimate, a cabal of, quote, white supremacists, women haters, science deniers, religious fundamentalist zealots, and warmongers who will eventually start a nuclear war. We're joined now by Sinsara Taylor. She's an organizer with Refuse Fascism. Sinsara, thanks for joining us. So I was reading your... Um, your manifesto tonight, and, and you said this, the Trump regime is a fascist regime, no insults or exaggeration, that's what it is. For the future of humanity and the planet, we the people must drive this regime out. So I'm assuming you're not a, a moderate, necessarily, but the obvious question arises, which is, if it's a fascist regime, how are you on this show? Look, Donald, we're facing an emergency. Humanity yeah. is facing an emergency. A fascist regime has seized the reins of power in the most powerful, actually the sole superpower in the world. They, Trump and Pence are operating out of Hitler's playbook, only they have nuclear weapons. And what RefuseFascism.org is saying to the world is that while it's beautiful, it's righteous that millions of people have stood up in protest and continue to do so. And by the way, since I know he sometimes watches, President Trump, if you're watching, way more people have protested than were at your Nazi inauguration. But while this is beautiful, this resistance needs to grow, and people need to confront that this is a fascist regime that could drop the hammer and close down. It's working aggressively to close down the space for people to stand up and resist. And so, in the name of humanity, seven billion on this planet, we need to pour into the streets and say, no, we refuse to accept a fascist America. We refuse to accept this for the world, and we must drive them out. We need to stay it, in the streets. I mean, so many questions come to mind, but the other. He has a Twitter feed. He has that ugly orange thing on top of his head. And he has nuclear weapons, the biggest nuclear arsenal in the world. And people better wake up because he is more dangerous than Hitler ever but could if have you, been. But I mean, let's just Absolutely. be real for a second. No, I know we're on TV, but please be real. On, if you on, really you thought on, that. Hold on. I mean, you, implied, on. you implied something, and I want to answer it. You implied that I'm going to do something that's untoward, whatever. I'm calling for mass political protest and resistance, building on what's happened and staying in the streets in the name of humanity. Before the man starts, he asked three times, if I have nukes, why can't I use them? No, I this can is see the your, mass I, incineration of human uh, okay, beings on an I get industrial it. I can scale. See that you're, I can see your spun against up here. Humanity. But let's just be more specific. Now, again, spoiler, I, I personally think these claims are ridiculous. I don't think... They really come from anything solid or tangible. I think they're gut feelings, and, and that really doesn't have a place in enlightened and educated political discourse. But perhaps she could be forgiven, because as I've said, there are multiple examples of these um, Hitler comparisons, and it, it, even politicians... Are saying this uh there was uh, politicians and celebrities you know I, i've got some examples here uh you know there was um, msnbc's chris matthews said that the idea of america first had a hitlerian background to it uh referring specifically to the inauguration speech which we've already broken down in this channel and of course, there isn't um, there isn't a politician that's run for office. I think that hasn't said we're going to put our country, our people first, because funnily enough, that's what the electorate wants. Because the citizens of that country, I think the idea of being patriotic and saying our country comes first is somehow equated to dictatorial, totalitarian, or fascist. I think is fairly ridiculous. Although, sure, many fascist leaders have intoned the exact same you know, kind of um, lip service, if you like. Uh, Ashley Judd uh, also said, um, I didn't know devils could be resurrected, but I feel Hitler in these streets. A mustache traded for a toupee. Nazis renamed the cabinet. Electro-conversion therapy. The new gas chamber shaming the gay out of America, turning rainbows into suicide notes. I mean, this is it doesn't bear breaking down. I mean, it's just gibberish hyperbole. Now, I don't want to list too many examples because it'll make the video too long, and I, I don't want this to necessarily be too long a video. But, um, you know, you can think of the Huffington Post. They've certainly compared Trump to Hitler multiple times. Uh, many leftist blogs have coined the phrase Orange Hitler to kind of deride 
Donald Trump's skin tone. Um, also, think Rachel Maddow at uh, MSNBC, who has certainly compared Trump to Hitler on more than one occasion. And indeed, in an interview in Rolling Stone magazine in July, she said that studying Hitler had helped her understand Trump and his rise to power. The specific quote uh, is, over the past year, I've been reading a lot about what it was like when Hitler first became chancellor, and I'm gravitating towards moments in history for subliminal references in terms of cultures that have unexpectedly veered into dark places, because I think that's possibly where we are. Certainly, um, there's been just too many examples to, to list, ultimately. I, I think Cracked as well. Uh, did an article, you know, five ways in which Trump's rise to power perfectly mirrors uh, that of Adolf Hitler, and and the list goes on. But I want to kind of just give the counterbalance to that argument, and 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 let's just understand that this isn't a new thing. Donald Trump isn't such a horrendous figure that he bears comparison to Hitler. In, in fact, it's actually the other way around. Hitler is such a horrendous historical figure that anyone you want to denigrate or shut down politically, you compare them to him. That is why Hitler gets brought up so often. And indeed, uh, I will quote a historian called Victor Davis Hansen. And he has said on this phenomenon that uh, the Trump as Hitler rhetoric is just a reawakening of Bush as Hitler uh, rhetoric from 10 years ago. Reagan was Hitler before that. And here are the um, interesting things he had to say about it to counter this unfair comparison. He said Hitler's central ethos was hatred and scapegoating of the Jews whose logical trajectory was the Holocaust. Trump is, in contrast, a strong Israel supporter. His daughter is a Jewish convert. Three of his children are, sorry, three of his grandchildren are Jewish. Trump went to the inner city and sought to reach out to minorities. Hitler attempted a coup in 1923 before subverting the constitution in 1934. His entire modus operandi was street thuggery and crude violence. Trump has staged no such demonstrations. In fact, his opposition is more likely to hit the street and turn to violence to express its opposition, as we've seen with the Antifa thuggery and, and other such nonsense. People being attacked in the street for wearing a red baseball cap. Hitler's cent he, sorry, he continues. Hit Hitler's central foreign policy theme was territorial aggrandizement in an effort to reverse the verdict of Versa Versailles. Trump, if anything, is more likely to disengage rather than to occupy or attack foreign countries. Hitler, when assuming power, dismantled all constitutional limitations on the chancellorship. Trump claims he wants to restore constitutionalism. After Obama signed treaties without Senate concurrence, used pen and phone executive orders to override or ignore existing laws, ignored the War Powers Act, gave passes to sanctuary cities, and used federal agencies to bypass the Congress to make de facto laws. So this historian certainly is, is of a Republican bent, but he makes salient points that the comparison isn't fair and I, you know i want to continue as well by just giving you some other examples uh if you look at what was happening historically with germany at the time of hitler's rise to power there are many mitigating circumstances when i was a child it was all often explained to me by my family many of whom had served in the military and certainly my grandparents uh, still had some very ill feelings about this, as I imagine anybody who fought in World War II would. And they told me that, they maintained that the German people absolutely knew what Hitler was planning, and, and it was they, they were all kind of, um, you know, complicit in all the atrocities. And, and that, of course, is nonsense. It's a terrible thing to foist on a child. And I'm going to give you a very profound demonstration of why that it definitely isn't true but germany had just lost world war one it was reeling from that it, 
you know, had had millions of people killed, 4% of its population, in fact, which is way beyond anything that, that has ever happened uh, to the United States in any of, of their conflicts. I suppose you'd have to go to the American Civil War to even get close to anything as profoundly horrific. Uh, and there was a very real sense of trauma in the population. They couldn't believe that they'd lost. They couldn't believe they'd lost so many in pursuit of what felt at the time like a very hollow goal. Now, that led to an economic crisis. Uh, you're reeling from losing 4% of your population, losing a war, being internationally castigated. And then in 1929, you have this great depression. Uh, so there was this now profound economic shock as, as well. So Hitler's rise came in, an, in, a, in a set of political uh, preconditions that, that I don't think exist in, in modern America right now and will likely never exist in a country again. I think it also bears remembering that Germany was new to democracy. It was a, a new country. The Germany that we know was founded in 1871. Um, so it, it, it is very new to this idea. It, it hadn't seen the rise of a demagogue or somebody that was going to subvert the political system in the way Adolf Hitler did. They, they hadn't encountered it before. Modern Americans are very political, politically savvy. Uh, and I think, again, when people talk about, uh, an, an uninformed electorate, uh, you hear this from the me, you know, leftist, elitist media a lot about how all the people in the Rust Belt are just morons. That's why they voted for Trump. Um, this this is a very different allegation, if you like, to, to what you, you could legitimately say about the average German voter at that time, that this was a very new system. They hadn't seen anyone like Adolf Hitler exist in that system. There was no understanding of what could happen. This is why Adolf Hitler is an incredibly important touchstone in history and needs to be remembered and why comparisons of this sort, frivolously made, are actually disgusting and very damaging. But uh, what Donald Trump is, is a right-wing populist and by comparison to what Hitler was was doing actually Hitler wanted to effectively dismantle democracy he felt democracy was decadent he, he felt it had let the country down he wanted to seize power and maintain power laboring under this delusion that only him and the National Socialist Party could propel Germany to where where it should be uh, the fatherland and he wanted to dismantle democracy to ensure nobody could disrupt that process actually Donald Trump needs democracy you can't make the charge that someone is a populist and appeals to the lowest common denominator and then and, and that's why they've been elected and then say, actually, they don't want democracy at all. Democracy would be a very good servant to any populist. And this is another kind of gross misrepresentation of the fact. I think as well, it, it bears mention that there's been a huge discounting, if you like, of experiences from people who survived in Hitler's Germany People don't seem as interested in going back into history and speaking to the people who were there and asking what they think, because I, I, I feel they have a perspective that needs to be respected. I think they have a perspective that we should truly listen to before we get carried away with hysteria and hyperbole. And with that in mind, I would draw you to someone called Anita Dittman. Anita Dittman is somebody who survived the Holocaust as a Jewish girl in Germany. She survived through the 30s and 40s under the Nazi regime. And she spoke out on Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is January the 27th, 
in an interview with WND, that's worldnetdaily.com, and she said that uh, any when they say he is another Hitler, referring to Trump, they are crazy. If he was another Hitler, he'd be shooting people that riot, and they wouldn't have the freedom to riot. If anybody was against things in Nazi times, they would ship them off to the ovens, as we called the camps. There was no freedom. And this is uh, somebody who has written a memoir called Trapped in Hitler's Hell. There was a documentary adaptation of it. But this is uh, very important, I think, that Holocaust survivors are telling you that this modern society is, is very different to the to Hitler's Germany and even to the rise of Hitler's Germany to, before it the conditions were different and I certainly don't think anything like a holocaust could ever happen again I do not think the international community would ever allow it I do not think the international community would even allow it to get to a point where anything that looked vaguely similar would be allowed to occur again it simply wouldn't happen there was a lot of disinformation disbelief surrounding the holocaust people couldn't believe that they weren't just work camps that they were in actual fact death camps and by the time people realized what was going on we were entrenched in a global war to stop the rise of an aspiring fascist superpower the holocaust is truly one of the low points of human history like any genocide should be considered and i i feel that again you do a great disservice to holocaust survivors when you talk about trump and you talk about hitler in the same breath so with all of this in mind i'd like to draw your attention to a historical figure that you may or may not know about um, somebody who I think definitely deserves your attention and your accolades. And that was Sophia Magdalena Scholl, who was a German student and a anti-Nazi political activist who was executed on the 22nd of February, 1943, aged just 21. Her crimes which were to be the member of the White Rose Society, which was a non-violent, keywords there, non-violent resistant group uh, against the Nazis. Uh, she distributed anti-war and anti-Nazi leaflets, and this crime was deemed to be high treason. And for those crimes, she was executed in Stadelheim Prison, Munich, and uh, at just a tender age of, of 21. Now, uh, Sophia um, was the daughter of uh, a, a fierce Nazi critic in the form of Robert Scholl, who was the mayor of her hometown, Falkenberg am Kirche. And again, apologies if my German pronunciation is terrible. It's been many years since I um, ever had cause to speak. Uh, the little German I do. Uh, but she was somebody who, even at a very young age, had her own mind. Um, at the time when, when she was 12, she was brought into the Bund Deutsche Mädel, which is the League of German Girls. It was effectively a kind of almost like a, you know, Hitler Youth type program. And she was very enthusiastic about it initially, but then realized that, you know, this was a form of political indoctrination. She didn't like it and started to criticize things, even as a young girl. Um, her brother, Hans, who had also been in, in the Hitler Youth, um, had become very disillusioned with the, the Nazi party. And they started to explore 
other political movements. They started to push back against the political norm. Um, and, and she started to focus on art and f philosophy and theology and to open her mind. Um, she nearly didn't um, graduate from school because she felt the educational system was just an extension of state indoctrination, um, but she did and uh, was obviously a very educated person and she uh, herself uh, worked in a, as a kindergarten teacher trying to teach children away from this indoctrination that was going on in the schools of Germany at the time. Like a lot of Germans of the time, she spent a, a stint kind of uh, conscripted, if you like, into the national service, into, into the military, um, focusing on the more medical uh, aspects of, of the military. And she was already thinking about what passive resistance might look like when her boyfriend communicated things to to her via letter that he'd seen while he was out on the Eastern Front. He spoke very openly of German war crimes and how he'd seen prisoner of wars being killed and the creation of mass graves, how he'd heard firsthand of the mass executions of the Jews. And she talked a lot about the theology of conscience is uh, what it was referred to in the letters that they exchanged, that she believed there was some higher power that meant she had to act from a humanist point. These were brought up and quoted in her trial. They, they actually formed the basis of her defense. But this is what led to the creation of the White Rose and, and the pamphlets that they distributed. So the White Rose came together and it was Sophia and uh, her brother, her boyfriend, and a few of the like-minded people who wanted to push back against what the Nazi government was doing, but didn't want to do it in a violent manner. And they printed pamphlets and, and distributed them. And within the pamphlets, it was to basically tell people to passively resist the Nazi government, to disobey any order they felt their conscience couldn't live with. By the time they had distributed their sixth pamphlet, uh, the Nazi government and the Nazi spies and secret police were very well informed of their activities. There were numerous, um, how should we say, incentives to rat out political dissidents to to expose them and you would be rewarded for doing so although many people didn't do it for rewards they did it out of fear that if they didn't they may be considered to be complicit with these heinous crimes of speaking out against Hitler's government and in one fell swoop in 1943 in February 1943 they were all arrested and um, taken into the People's Court before Judge Roland Freisler. Uh, in her defense, she said, somebody, after all, had to make a start. What we wrote and said is also believed by many others. They just don't dare express themselves as we did. The court was incredibly biased. This this wasn't a court as you would understand it or, or know it. it. It wasn't interested in serving justice beyond serving the whims of the dictator that had deemed these to be crimes anyway. The defendants weren't allowed any testimony beyond that statement that Sophia had said. And on this day in 1943, Sophia and her brother and um, their mutual friend Christoph Probst were all found guilty of treason and beheaded by a guillotine. And that was that. Uh, she was afforded the privilege of last words before she died. And um, she said, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day, and I have to go. But what does my death matter 
if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action. Uh, they are fine last words, as tragic as they are, and they are definitely worth remembering. And I want to compare these modern day protesters, the people who are out there who think that Donald Trump is a Hitler-like figure. I want them to ponder about what Sophia Scholl did, how she was out there knowing that she was likely to lose her life for protesting and distributing information, telling people to protest the Nazi government. She knew that she could die for doing it and, and did it anyway because she believed it was the morally right thing to do. And I would like those protesters to understand and be truly grateful that they live in a society where this will not happen. You will not be renditioned in the middle of the night for going out onto the streets. You will not be executed for comparing Donald Trump to Hitler. The fact that you can compare Donald Trump to Hitler is proof that he is not Hitler at all. And I also would like these protesters to realize that these people absolutely knew that you do not combat fascism you do not combat violence with more fascism and more violence Sophie Shaw was as much talking about free speech the right to individual liberty as anything else and when you make these unfair comparisons when you through your distorted version of history when you compare yourself to people like her, it's grotesque. We've seen protesters doing things that are unforgivable, unjustifiable, unethical, and, and have nothing in common with the brave people that try to passively resist Hitler's Germany. And I, I would urge people to think, to stop this hyperbole, and to actually come back down to planet Earth with the rest of us and engage in rational political discourse, because to not do it is to denigrate the memories of people who died in this awful and appalling manner. I will end this video with the words of a professor of German history who is based in Aberdeen, Scotland, called Thomas Weber, a very well-respected historian, and he said in an article in the Washington Post recently that there is a crying wolf danger of an inflationary use of Hitler comparisons, for instance, that nobody will take Hitler comparisons seriously anymore when they really should and have to be made. The danger also is that people will rally to defend the people who unfairly have been compared to Hitler and feel sorry for them rather than to figure out what's wrong with them. And in this sense, I think everybody can agree, whichever side of the political spectrum you're on, whatever your beliefs, that these comparisons to Hitler need to be reserved for the next Hitler. I hope we never see one. I don't think we will. I don't think the modern society can ever allow for that. Uh, certainly, I don't think it's Donald Trump and I think we should all remember that uh, before we really start to lose our collective minds while having this discussion. Anyway, as I said, it was the anniversary of the death of Sophia Scholl. I, I thought it was an important story to tell, perhaps one that we can learn something from in this modern political climate. Uh, thanks very much for watching the video. I certainly hope to see you on the next one.